Welcome, everyone. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's the 100th anniversary of the New School. And I think from its very beginning, the New School was founded as a place for open intellectual discussion, debate about important issues, real world issues, in a way the founders of the New School um, didn't think was going on at other universities, particularly the one up the road at, at, um, at Columbia. Uh, so I think uh, 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 we are celebrating that founding of the New School with a whole range of activities. We have over 185 different events uh, going on in the next, well, over, the, over the, the five or six day period we've been running the festival, the festival of the new. So uh, please go and see other ones uh, um, that you like. But tonight we're talking about social justice, equity, but most importantly in the immigration area, focusing on the immigration area. And one thing I would uh, pitch for you is that at the end, very end of the festival on Sunday, uh, we're actually taking a trip out to Ellis Island, um, led by our Zolberg Center of Migration um, for the final event of the, um, final event of the um, uh, festival. Again, that's because the new school, if you look through its history, it's been immigrants who really driven it. So if you go back to the original, um, original activities, you saw many, and you look, at the, you look at the people in the audiences from back in the 1920s, many, many immigrants were participating in trying to get some level of higher education. It wasn't degree education. They, were certain, they couldn't get into the universities, but they were getting some kind of education. And then you go through the university in exile period when the new school brought in a whole range of, of um, uh, social science scholars fleeing Nazi Germany. Uh, so it's always been about that, right up until, right up until this very day. Um, so without more, let me turn it over to uh, Maya Wiley. Maya Wiley, as you. Now, Maya Wiley joined the, joined the New School in 2016 uh, as our very first Senior Vice President for Social Justice, as well as being the Henry Cohen um, Professor uh, of Public Policy in the Milano School. Just recently, she stepped down from that uh, in order to work on a book uh, and also, hey, how's it going, by the way? <laughs> how's it going, by the way, book? Uh, <laughs> okay, well, we'll push for that. Um, but also, it's a pretty important year, and in one of her other activities, in case you didn't know, she appears on MSNBC, the legal analyst, so. But I'll let her introduce our guest tonight, so thank you very much, Wiley, uh, Maya, and uh, Wiley, Maya. <laughs> it's great to have you here again. All right. Thank you, David. <clears throat> And thank you all for coming. Uh, it's an honor to be hosting this conversation with Paola and Jose. And I'm gonna give them a brief introduction and admit up front that this is a completely inadequate reductionist summary of all that they are and all that they've done. So I would really invite you to go check them out online. Um, but Paola is a film director, activist, author, and artist working at the leading edge of human rights a co-founder of the Women's March. How many of you are at the Women's March? Come on, come on, come on. Okay, I almost wore my pussy hat. Uh, she served as its artistic director and co-authored the New York Times best-selling book, Together We Rise, Behind the Scenes at the Protest Heard Around the World. And she has an upcoming book in 2020, I believe it will be released, called Sanctuary. So I hope you will check that out. And Jose is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, Emmy nominated filmmaker, and Tony nominated producer, in case any of us now feel inadequate. Uh, a leading voice for the human rights of immigrants. He founded the nonprofit media and cultural organization, I'm sure you all know, called Define American, named one of the most innovative companies by Fast Company. And his best selling memoir, Dear America Notes of an Undocumented Citizen, was published in 2018. So please welcome Paula and Jose. Um, so I, I can tell you that um, both of them are both incredibly well-informed, incredibly active, incredibly important leaders in their own right. Um, but I wanted to frame the conversation up a little bit because the title, you know, I think the title, and we, we talked about this a little bit beforehand, it was very hard to come up with the right title for something as expansive as what we're seeing and experiencing 
uh, in the United States and the world today. Uh, but I thought we should at least frame it with a couple of fact points. Because we're in a post-fact society, folks, so our job is to go back to facts. Um, and one is that, no number one, the asylum laws that we have uh, that are both international laws, Geneva Convention, uh, and also laws of the United States really originated after World War II as a result of the Holocaust, as a result of Nazi Germany. Uh, and if you recall, we don't have the best history in this country of welcoming in Jews who were fleeing genocide. Um, <clears throat> but at the same time, we have a history of, in the Ellis Island event, I think, uses the word peopling because there's this whole question about how we people this country. Because we are not all immigrants, y'all. Um, first of all, we're sitting on land here at the New School that did not originate with immigrants. It did not. And the Lenape people and indigenous communities were here. <laughs> um, but also, even within the context of US history, of course, this notion of migration and immigration, we did not all come here by our own free will slavery. And migration really only means the movement from one place to another, and one of the greatest migrations in the history of the United States is black people moving from the rural south beginning in the early 1900s to the northeast, the west, uh, and the midwest, right? Six million people, six million black people migrated in this country in the 20th century. And a lot of what they were fleeing was very similar to some of the oppressions we know people are immigrating to the US seeking to get away from. Um, so, I, I, and just in terms of a lot of the way the debate has, has turned in the US, I think one writer um, in the nation in August called it uh, a, ma a made in the USA crisis by which the person meant why people migrate in the first place is often because of factors that are outside of their control and in this context, US foreign policy. Mm -hmm. uh, and we should own and recognize that, that the way in which US foreign policy created right-wing military militias in the 70s and 80s that created first waves of migration in large numbers, say from El Salvadorans, uh, that's relevant not only because of the history, but it's relevant because one of the things that research has told us is people choose where to go, not haphazardly. They choose where to go because they have family members. And there's often some colonial or other connection to the country that they try to go to in order to seek freedom from violence, freedom from persecution, uh, or freedom from economic oppression. Mm -hmm. uh, and in now, increasingly, freedom from the tremendous devastating crises created by climate change, which we in the US have greatly contributed to. So I just wanted to frame all that up <laughs> to say that these, these are very complicated issues, and we typically, when we talk about the crisis at the border, we don't talk about, we talk about it as if it just erupted out of nowhere and not as if it wasn't a long time, in fact, decades in the making. Um, and only 3% of the world's population lives in a country they weren't born in. Only 3%. But it's a crisis, isn't it? But it's a crisis. Uh, and as we all know, capital flows quite freely across borders and people do not. Um, but I also wanted to start, because we, 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 we framed this around citizenship, and I, I did that intentionally, I admit it. Um, but I want to just give one example of why. Um, in February 26, 2015, a 20-year-old Guatemalan man named Almacar Perez Lopez was shot in the back six times from the, by the San Francisco Police Department. He was undocumented, living in the U.S., and the sole provider, his remittances of his paycheck back home was the only financial support in his family's household. He was shot in the back six times by San Francisco police officers who claimed that he had a knife and was coming at them. And because of activism and organizing on the part of the community, 
eventually including paying for an autopsy that they couldn't get the city to pay for and conduct, the autopsy report found that he was shot in the back which is inconsistent with the story that the police officers told of him coming at them with a knife. And part of why I tell that story is because, what does it remind you of? Well, my experience of that story was very not, oh, this is what happens to undocumented Im immigrants. It was, this is what happens to brown and black people. Uh, and that we are all, uh, there are various forms of vulnerability that revolve around race and then additional forms of vulnerability that revolve around whether you have a recognition of citizenship status. And that isn't always having a passport, but it also includes having a passport. So citizenship is more than just having a passport. It's also about who belongs and how, and that's why we added belonging. Um, so I just wanted to frame that so you know how I was thinking about it, because I get to ask questions. And we will create some time for you as well. Uh, so I wanted to start with this idea, you are both witnesses. And I, I say that very explicitly and thinking about the tradition of you know, people like James Baldwin, but I wonder if you would talk a little bit about what you have witnessed and how you think about your role as witnesses, because you're activist witnesses, you're not passive witnesses. Um, and Paula, maybe we'll start with you and then I would love it if you'd pick up, Jose, you know where I'm gonna go with this which is also the story of you recognizing a difference in witnessing from your own experience at, at the border. Yeah, thank you. Uh, first, thank you for that framing because it's so spot on and so important and that there's, I get asked constantly a lot of those questions around the history of where we are and how we got here. Um, so thank you for that. I, I'm an immigrant. I came to this country when I was three years old and I came to Los Angeles. I'm from Colombia. And I like to say that at that time, I was the only Colombian in LA. Um, so I was honorary Mexican. And all the white people would be like, oh, you're Mexican? And I would be like, no, I'm Colombian. They'd be like, oh, isn't that the same thing? And I'd be like, oh. So that's kind of where I come from. Um, but in that, my personal story is that I saw my mother um, make miracles happen every day. We were homeless at times. We were on welfare at times. My mom's first job was in a fast food restaurant um, where she learned English from an Italian woman that didn't speak English. And that was how I grew up. And that was my normal. That was my everyday. And, and I clearly remember the first time also when I was told that my mom was an American. When in fact, by a fluke of situation, she was American. She happened to be born in the United States. Um, and then as a filmmaker, as a storyteller, I. I decided that the stories that I wanted to tell were the stories of my mother, were what I like to call our unsung heroes in this country. The people who we walk down the street and we don't even see because we don't think, quote unquote, they are important. And yet, their contributions to this country, and this always gets me very emotional, but their contributions to this country are what make this country, the idea of it, possible. Uh, my mother didn't graduate from college. She never had the ability to go to college, but she raised me, um, a, a woman who's now a mother that went to college, went to grad school, and ultimately organized the largest demonstration against a sitting president in the United States. And, and I say that, I actually say that not to pat myself on the back, but that's the glory and the beauty of my mother. And so when I go and I bear witness um, to these to people that the past year and a half of my life has been, has been spent telling the stories of, I don't like to call them migrants, I call them refugees because they are indeed refugees. They are fleeing sexual violence, physical violence, economic violence, climate destruction. Um, they, they are, they are the, some of the most vulnerable people in this, in this world. And so to me, they are by definition refugees. And I go to them and I don't see them um, as a threat that the administration has, has wanted us to believe them to be, I see them with the possibilities of my mother. I see in their children the possibility of who Jose is and what Jose has done. Um, I see in them the possibility of Maya, Professor Maya, and doing the greatness that she has done. And so, so to me, that is how I decide to bear witness, how I decide to say, my, my talent as a storyteller 
is to tell their stories honestly, truthfully, um, in a way that is filled with dignity and love. Because imagine if this country actually saw them in that frame, how different our policy would actually be. If we saw a mother who I met on the caravan, a single mother of four children, she walked thousands of miles for two and a half months with a three-month-old, a two-year-old, a five-year-old, and an 11-year-old. The resiliency, the strength, the intelligence, the capacity, the bravery to get to this country undeterred with four children on her own if we saw her for the glorious person that she actually is and made our policy framed around that, how? How different we would be. And so that is what I, how I see the world and how I try and, and, and walk in this, this, this moment in time as, as a storyteller and as someone that is bearing witness with a very um, unfiltered and unapologetic point of view. Thank you. So, Jose, will you tell the, both okay, the story gonna, and the context that we talked yes, about? Yes, the context. Well, you should just know that Paula is like one of my best friends, and we haven't done a panel like this before, so who knows what's going to come out of our mouths in the next few minutes, so I don't know what's going to happen. Um, so, um, I, I feel like, because Maya and I were talking on the phone yesterday about this panel, and I was, I've, been, I've been struggling to write this essay about the difference between allies and witnesses. Like, what's the difference between the two in terms of language? I actually think we are where we are right now in this country because we haven't been precise with our language, right? Like, I don't want to drag Toni Morrison into this conversation, but so much of this has been about the fact that the people who are doing the defining, right, haven't had justice and equality in mind, <laughs> right? The definers get to define the frames of the conversation. And I have to tell you what Maya just elucidated in the beginning of this panel is the kind of factual, contextualized explanation of where we are that I don't even read in the New York Times and the Washington Post or here in NPR. You don't. Like, we love to pat ourselves on the back and just say, we are a country of immigrants. And we just put that out there without really interrogating what that means and who we, and who we, who we erase by doing so, right? So for me, when it comes to witness bearing, a lot of it starts with risk taking. Mm. Like, what risks we take. So for me, it's been very specific, right? Like, I, <laughs> I lived on 14th and 6th next to the Urban Outfitters. <laughs> Not too far from here. I lived there from 2009 to 2015. No, 14. And um, I lived there through probably like the height of my depression, trying to figure out how, why am I such a coward? Um, I was working at the time at the Huffington Post. I was writing for The New Yorker. My first documentary was premiering at the Tribeca Film Festival. And I was in the closet and lied to everybody about how I, was, how I was here illegally. I lied to all of my employers and to my friends. Like lies, like lies like, oh, I'm gonna get married in Mexico. Can you come? You know, like I can't. So then I lie about, oh, I don't like Mexico. <laughs> or, you know, like little lies that you have to tell just so you can pass, right? And you can, you can, um, you can kind of, I thought success would protect me. So I completely bought into this idea that the American dream, meritocracy, that so long as I had an apartment in, you know, in Union Square and I had the job and I had the awards, I didn't need papers, right? Clearly that was wrong. And so I took this risk of coming out as undocumented without knowing what was gonna happen. Like I literally did not know what was gonna happen. To the point where after I came out in June 2011, I actually called ICE myself, like in December, and like, hi, I haven't heard from you. <laughs> While I was living in that apartment, I called ICE. I haven't heard from you. Like Obama was deporting 400,000 immigrants that year in 2011. I don't understand why I wasn't one of them. And I'm saying all this as a context because that's when Paula like entered my life. So I met her around 2011. Um, she made an incredible film called Entre Nos. You should check it out. Actually, she basically, it's about her mom and she plays her mom. And it's this beautiful 
It's, it's one of those things, Paula, that I think you don't, we don't know it now, but years and decades from now, when people try to make sense of what happened, I think they're gonna look at that film, right? So I met her then, and we've had this relationship where we push each other, where even just before dinner, before coming here, and she was reminding me of what my role is. And so the anecdote that I wanna share is, um, I've been everywhere in the country in the past eight years doing the work that I do. I'd never been to South Texas. Uh, back in 2014, I don't know if you remember, that was when the Central American refugees who the Obama administration did not want to call refugees were coming in. And Paula and I were texting, and I forget Paula, remind me. Like we both decided that we were gonna go down there to document what was happening and film at the churches that were receiving these children. And again, this was 2014. This is when nobody cared. Yeah. Nobody cared. I'll never forget even watching uh, Secretary Clinton being inter interviewed by Jorge Ramos, saying they should go back, send them back. And all I can think of was like, oh my God, Hillary Clinton, a champion of children's rights her entire life. Even she couldn't scrape the politics out of it. Mm -hmm. And she had to say that. So we get there, I get there, I didn't tell anybody, I flew in, I just, because I flew in, I had a flight the next day, we were just gonna film for a few hours. I get there and realize my lawyer texted me and said, oh, it's great that you're there, how are you gonna get out? So what are you talking about? I have a flight tomorrow, I'm going to LA. No, 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 you're in South Texas, there are border patrol agents everywhere. Like, how are you gonna get out of the airport? I was like, what? I never, I didn't know. So then <laughs> I started telling people and then the people there were like, oh, we're surprised you showed up. We didn't think you'd show up because how are you gonna get out? I was like, what? I don't know if you've been to South Texas. It's like basically like a military zone. You can't swing a purse without hitting a border patrol agent or an ICE agent. So I tell Paula this, she gets there. We're freaking out, like how are we gonna get me out? And then I got in a call, a conference call with the people that got me there. And they were like, oh, we should put you in a trunk of a car and try to get to El Paso or San Antonio. Like, we don't want you arrested here. And we were having, Paula, remind me, we were having lunch at this Mexican restaurant. And we were with the filmmakers that we hired from Houston who like drove down. And I was literally like, what do I do? Do I stay? and hide in this trunk? I'm a big guy, I'm not sure I'm gonna fit in the trunk. And you know, this is like J.Lo and George Clooney and out of sight or something, like what's going on? Like I don't, or do I actually be radically transparent and tell people that I'm here and I don't know if I'm gonna get out and try to get out? And Paula and I were sitting next to each other and she gave me this look <laughs> of like, I think you know what you need to do. So it meant stay, and it meant I actually went through the airport, the TSA agent, the Border Patrol guy was sitting next to the TSA agent, the Border Patrol guy asked me, are you here illegally? I don't lie anymore. <laughs> yes. And then I get arrested on the spot, I get detained. But it was, you know, I wrote about it, it's, it's whatever, it was only eight hours. but. Um, like, Paula and I know each other and love each other to such an extent that in some ways, she has been one of the people in my life who has witnessed all of this and made sure that I had the right compass. That I was making decisions not for other people but for myself. You know when you have friends that like, they push you to make sure that you are being your fullest self? So for me, the role of witnesses in that way is, um, life-saving and life-defining in a way. I don't think I'd be doing the kind of work and I wouldn't be doing it in the way that I do it if I didn't have someone like Paula like there with me to make sure that I'm, that I'm answering not to activists, not to politicians, but to myself. I love you. See, what we're talking about, we don't know what's gonna happen. Okay, great. <laughs> So, I mean, you're both 
witnesses, um, and, I, and you know, in the black tradition, witness doesn't mean a bystander. And that's a, really why I wanted you to tell us. Both your stories really make clear that your witnessing is also about your own experiences, as well as talking about the experiences of others and bringing it to a broader audience. Can you talk some about what you have seen? In others, witness for us and share with us. You, you have both talked about, and, and Paula, I w that really wanted you not just to maybe share some of the stories, um, but really the implication of people's experiences getting to the border and then in detention. Yeah. Um, for the past, I guess, two years now, almost two years, since family separation, since the height of family separation, I have um, heard and seen a lot of awful things. And I often say that family separation broke me as an, as an activist um, and even as an artist in the sense that I was receiving calls from mothers calling me, crying desperately, unable to speak because they were crying so bad because they had just gotten off the phone with their child who was a detention center across the country and the kid told them, I'm looking outside and I see a plane and why can't I be on that plane and why can't I be with you, mama, just come and get me. And the mom, not being able to talk because she's trying so hard to not cry and having to hang up the phone and then calling me because she had no other option, right? Because this is what the government, our government of the United States was doing to people. Um, that is something that didn't happen once or twice. That has happened over 3,000 times we are, to 3,000 different families. We are still digging in to more people that have been separated. And obviously, as we know, family separation has continued to happen. I was just on the phone five days ago with the woman who was separated from her little sister and she's been separated with, from her for six months. Um, I have gone down to the, to, the, to the caravan and I have talked to people about their experiences coming to the United States on the caravan. I've talked about sexual violence, I've talked about sexual assault. And that is, the journey here is awful, for sure. There is no doubt about it. But since 2014, when I went um, to the border with Jose, all the way through today, 2019, so five years, consistently, consistently, when I ask people what the most difficult part of their journey has been, consistently the people say detention in the United States was by far the most horrible experience they've ever had. And I think that that's really important for us to hear because we like to, I think it's human nature to say, oh my God, that thing over there, that journey for them, how horrible, how heartbreaking, how atrocious. But the reality is that their experience, some people in detention for four days, I recently spoke to a woman that was in detention for 65 days, was by far the worst. And we know the stories now that have come out recently. We know that they haven't been, they've been given, to, they've been eat, given food once a week. They've been, I've spoken to women that were allowed to shower once in 24 days. Like, that is insane. Um, sleeping on the floor, sick. We know about the kids that were taking care of kids. Like, that again is all on our watch. That is happening by design, intentionally, by our government to do exactly what is happening now, which is less people coming. It's all deterrence. Yep. They want to detour, and they want to detour because they don't want brown and black immigrants in this country. And that is also critically important for us to understand. You know, I often talk about, we often hear like this idea of open borders and everybody wants open borders and they just want open borders. I'm not even going to have that conversation here tonight, but I will say there was a time in the United States when we had open borders and it was fucking Ellis Island. And Ellis Island was okay because it was white people. I know I'm kind of making it very simple in those simple terms, but like that's where we are. And so I think we need to... to recognize and reckon with where we are and what is happening. And there are things that we can do, and I know we're gonna talk about that, of how, how we can do, what we can do in order to, to, to help um, and try and 
change the situation that we currently find ourselves in. I would push even back and say open board. I was just in um, Buffalo. No, I was in St. Bonaventure University, which is an hour from Buffalo yesterday, because all the freshmen were assigned to read my book, which was nice. Um, all 900 of them. And I had to give a talk in front of all the students who read the book and then get questions. And one of the questions from a guy named Joe, whose family voted for Trump, he said probably, um, you know, do I believe in open borders in front of all the, the students? And I said, well, open borders. I mean, that's manifest destiny. <laughs> that was white man's burden. The borders have always been opened. So long as the people doing the opening, so long as the purposes serve what they wanted, right? And so I think the racial part of this and the class part of this is absolutely important, but to the witness-bearing part, I, for me, in some ways, so, and I, I haven't been, in, my lawyers, as you can imagine, I have lawyers, um, like, do not go back to South Texas. So I haven't been back. <laughs> and I should not. According to the lawyers, there's two places that I'm not allowed to go. South Texas and all of Georgia. I will say my mother was from Texas, and she didn't think anybody should go to Texas. <laughs> <laughs> but that's an <laughs> Or Georgia. Apparently, if I get, I get arrested in the state of Georgia, the immigration judges are the worst, so they can detain me for a while, right? So I have not gone there. But for me, the, the opposite part of this is the conversation has been the, the border has been so dominant and the wall has been so dominant, right? Regardless of the fact that 40% of the undocumented population overstayed their visa and didn't cross the border. I, yesterday, I was just looking at some study that said there's 800,000 undocumented Indians in this country, right, from India. The fastest growing undocumented population are coming from India, Korea, the Philippines, uh, China. Eastern Europe. Eastern Europe, um, the fact that we don't even really talk about undocumented black immigrants and Africans and Caribbeans and what they have to face and how systematic racism plays a role into all of that. Um, I'll never forget, actually, when I used to live here on 14th and 6th, I went to this dry cleaning place um, and I realized that the, the woman who was doing the dry cleaning was not charging my credit card. And I was like, oh, um, you're not charging my credit card. And she goes, oh, no, 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 we're the same. What? So she pulled from the cashier, she had the Time Magazine cover that I wrote, like, like on the cashier, and she pulled it out, we're the same. And then her son, who was working back in the back, was like, yeah, um, we're here, we don't document. They own two dry cleaning places in the village. I'm not gonna out them, but, but you know, but there's a lot, thankfully there's a lot of dry cleaning places. So, but, but the fear and the shame among the undocumented Asian community. And so what I'm dealing with a lot is DACA, right? So the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, the Supreme Court is probably gonna vote with the administration on November 12th. In November 12th. Um, please go to forward.us. Um, here is home, I think is the hashtag, which is a great hashtag. So I, here is home.us. So please people check that out. Um, I have probably calculated maybe 16, 17 DACA recipients that I know that I've been kind of mentoring for the past few years who have left. And they usually contact me because they feel guilty that I didn't qualify for DACA and I'm still here. How can I leave, Jose, if you're still here? And so part of what I have to do is actually say, like, look, like, you're raised in America, you went to school in America, you're gonna carry America with you wherever you go, and you have to give yourself permission to, lead, to actually live, right? Um, so I really don't know from an emotional standpoint, if, if you think about it, right? And again, this is why to me, the history of African Americans in this country is so essential in connecting these dots in terms of what happened during the Reconstruction period, right? And if you look at now, nine, about 900,000 people are gonna lose legal status in one day. What does that mean? Meaning, if you're an employer, if you're a college, if you're a university, like, how are you gonna deal with 
in many ways in modern U.S. history in the past 100 years, I don't know what the analogy is. Well, all of a sudden you gave them status for two years. They pay the government $500 so that the government doesn't deport them so they can work. Let me repeat. They pay the government, the, the deferred part of that name is deferral from deportation. So they pay the government $500 to not get detained so that they can work and pay the very same government the taxes, which then the government uses to detain and deport us. What kind of fucked up cycle is that? So I think for me, preparing ourselves for what those conversations are going to be and how uncomfortable and what kind of legal gray areas. I've been having conversations with employers who are like, how do I keep my DACA employee? And usually my answer is, well, what kind of law <laughs> are you willing to employ them through in, in, as an independent contractor? That's a legal gray area. Are you prepared to be in the legal gray area? What risks are you willing to take? Do you have lawyers? And so far, a lot of people, it's been 50-50. Because, I mean, we're, we're, so witness bearing to me is, what risk are you going to take? It may be as simple as when Thanksgiving happens, when your uncle or your aunt says something, <laughs> and you actually don't walk away. By the way, at Define American, we have this gift guide of uncomfortable conversations. You can download it. We literally coach you how to like sit through an uncomfortable dinner conversation and give you tools to like engage people. Because if you walk away, then who do they have? Sean Hannity? Rush Limbaugh? So, and in many ways, I think Paula and I, just because of the way we've done our work, we're dealing with different sets of borders and walls. And for me, the, the walls that are happening psychologically is in many ways just as insidious and damaging as the walls that we have physically put up. So I want, I want to stick, we, we, you know, we've come to this theme of belonging uh, that's in the title for this discussion. Uh, but I, I just want to go back and underscore, and so we sit with it for a minute, one of the things that, Paula, you said as we come back to the really powerful and important remarks you made, Jose. But this, I mean, I just want to put a real fine point on this. Women and girls are taking birth control to start their journey of migration because of the likelihood they will be violently raped. And yet they are saying that the conditions in US detention facilities is worse. I just don't want us to miss the real point that was underscoring detention is worse. Because the conditions coming here are horrific are horrific. Um, but if detention is worse. And even the language around that, it was a, it was a jail cell. It was, it was a jail a, cell, yeah. right? It, yeah. was, it was cement floor, it yeah. was cold. Yeah. <laughs> the kids, when I was detained, we were given peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, and I'm not sure that the, we were separated by gender. So I was with the boys. I don't know why we were separated by gender. So it was like five years old to like 14 years old. And we were given an apple and a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And I could tell that the kids had never seen a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. So, um, so I, it's cattle. And you know, for me, what was so, as everything's, everybody is, uh, assumes I'm, I'm, I'm Hispanic because of my name, so I'm, I'm Filipino. Um, to me, what I was trying to understand, what all the border patrol agents, everyone was brown. Everyone was Latinx. And I, I guess the writer in me to get lost in the moment, I was trying to imagine what was going through their minds as they were processing all of these children. Like what was going through their minds? You know, at one point when they were deciding to release me, I had to get interviewed by one of the border patrol agents. And I asked him and he goes, the benefits are solid, man. The benefits to be a border patrol agent, he needs a job, and the benefits are solid. <laughs> and 
and I think it's important to note, as we were talking earlier, that you know the detention system here in the United States is modeled after mass incarceration in the United States, yep. and it doesn't exist in a silo. It, it 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 is a replica of that, and even worse because it's less regulated. Mm -hmm. Worse in 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 I I believe in um, what is allowed to happen within those detention centers. It is less regulated. So so again, it is all interconnected and connected. Um, and all very much by design. Yeah. So let's come back to this notion of belonging and just I, I, I will say um, a big appreciation to Ari Melber on MSNBC because one of the shows that he did was he had former ICE age agents come on and, and talk, a, a Border Patrol rather, and talk about the process of acculturating Border Patrol staff through training to dehumanize people who are immigrating, um, which you can do. Now, it's the same conversation we have when police officers who are black shoot people who are black. Right? <laughs> you know? But there is a process of these institutions acculturating and desensitizing um, and dehumanizing and othering. But, but let's come back to the, the context of talking about this a race, race issue. Because I think this is really, you know, Paola, you said it in saying, look, this is about race, and we know changing demographics of America is, is definitely part of ratcheting up some of what we're seeing. We never see ads, we never see uh, of, of, for instance, Polish women who are undocumented who are day laborers, mm -hmm. although they are. Yeah. But they're not part of the ad campaigns mm -hmm. that we see either in political campaigns or in advocacy and C4 campaigns on legislation, it's always people who are brown. Mm -hmm. uh, and largely Latinx, ignoring also Asian undocumented immigration, because then we do the model minority myth. Right. Uh, but I so, I, so we know that immigrants themselves are multi-racial, multi-ethnic, come from many different backgrounds, and yet it's a racialized thing. But let's talk a little bit more about how that plays out in the work. So how do you witness appropriately, given that, and what are the tensions in it? Especially when we're in a political reality, we're talking about race. On some level, thank you, Donald Trump. He's made it a lot easier. I used to have a really hard time talking about race. <laughs> and now, you know, we can say white supremacy on cable TV. So is, Trump is, has done something. That? Somebody must tweet that. That is, like, really important. So, no, but seriously, it, it really, he's been so explicit that, and is, yeah. is that, that it's actually changed some of the public dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, but how do you witness, and how is that, what has that changed the advocacy and the witnessing strategies, and what are the tensions in it? So, I think, and again, this is like my, 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 uh, my sensibility is to complicate, right? I was, I was li listening to some Baldwin speeches on YouTube, which can always be, always be very dangerous. Uh, but he was talking about how we, you know, we live in a country that loves easy answers and don't like asking questions. Mm. He's absolutely right about that. And I, I remember after Trump got elected, having very uncomfortable conversations with DC leaders of groups, of which I will not name because my grandmother raised me to be polite, um, and telling them can you please not make this solely a Latinx issue? Mm -hmm. Can I give you undocumented black, undocumented Asian people, undocumented white people, so we can broaden this dialogue? And I remember the silence, the uncomfortability, and also <laughs> um, the tension, right? And I think, some of that I think is tied to, if you look at, at the end of the day, activists need to, advocates and activists need to make money. I mean, they need to, not make money, provide for their families. And so much of the funding of how all of this work happens is immigration is seen as a Latinx issue. Right, so the resources go there. I remember from the very beginning, I had a hard time back in 2011 trying to find undocumented black immigrant groups. You know, and I lived in New York. Of course, Baji, right, the Black Alliance for Just Immigration, meaning like even trying to figure out how do I find people and how do I bring them together? And sometimes the tension about this is not only um, 
interracial, it's also cross-generational, mm -hmm. right? Where you have people who, like, the, the tribalism of the issue, I think, has been in some ways a hindrance to the issue. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and again, like, I can get called out on this, because again, I'm not Latinx, right? I'm just, I just have a colonized name. Um, so I'm forcing myself to be even more honest, mm -hmm. which is really uncomfortable, <laughs> because we're all on the same side, so to speak. And yet I feel like I have to justify um, what I'm saying to people whose circumstances I share, mm. but because we're not from the same background or speak the same language, that becomes a wall in and of itself. Paula. Yeah, um, I will start off first by being positive in the sense that <laughs> I, I have been very inspired in the past you know, three and a half years since Trump came to uh, raise his hand as running for president and, and clearly defined it as he was going to be an anti-immigrant president. Um, that try as he might, in general, for the most part, he has been unable to pit the black community against the undocumented community. Um, and, and we have seen that, that very intentional trying to make us attack one another, because if we're divided, obviously we're weaker. And it, it, is, it has inspired my heart that the black community has not taken that bait. Um, at the same time, most recently when, when um, DACA was up, when they were doing some deal at some media, Congress, White House, I don't even remember because it's so fucking crazy now, but it was at the height of um, the, the crisis at the border, Trump essentially was said to folks, I will give the dreamers their dreamer bill if you all let me build this wall. And my heart froze because I was like, fuck. Are they going to take, are they going to do this? Are they going to take the bait, they being DACA recipients? Um, and there was a lot of talk a within the community, a lot of tension, a lot of talk, a lot of just like, what do we do? Because there are 800,000 young people, not even so young anymore, adults, that- Thank that, you, Paula. <laughs> that, that really want status. And are, are they going to give, get their status by harming another even more vulnerable community coming through. And who am I to judge, right? Like I have papers. I've had papers my whole life. And I, I wanna be very clear about that because people put it in their minds that I'm doing this work because I at one time was undocumented or I, what, n never, I'm, a, I'm an immigrant. So I have tremendous amount of privilege. So I am not one to, to, to to judge those that wanted that. I understand it from a human perspective. And yet, the dreamers, for lack of a better word, those DACA recipients persisted. And they were like, no, we're not going to do that. And I think that that, to me, is very inspiring um, as to the critical analysis of the long game for political, political power we are aware of. And, and we've been, we're understanding that this is a chess game. Um, um, and, and that it's, it's for the long term. Now that being said, um, you know, because the work that I've been doing for the past two years has been directly at the border and internationally, and Jose's work has been internal. Mm -hmm. um, previous to that, my work was all with DACA recipients, but now my, my mind is framed around um, the, the work at the border. You know, I go there and I'm looked at as an American. Right, and, and obviously I'm super light skinned and yes, I speak Spanish, but like I'm there, I'm an American and I'm, I have the, the best passport, the best privilege in the world. And that in of itself comes with a lot of racial dynamics, a lot of class dynamics, a lot of privilege that I'm constantly navigating. And I often have been very guilty of just focusing on Central Americans, just focusing on Latin Americans because that's the majority. That is the 90%. And yet, I actually, Baji called, they, they texted me one time when I was at the border and they were like, ha, like have you seen any Af African immigrants, black people? And I was like, uh, no, 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 I haven't. And then I thought to myself, I was like, I've been with 7,000 people and I haven't seen one black person. Like, that's not true. 
Let me go out tomorrow and let me actually look and let me actually see. And there, when I was called out about it, and they didn't call me out, they just asked me because they wanted me to highlight those stories, I started seeing and I was like, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh, and this story and this person from Togo and this person from Congo and like their stories from fucking Africa to Brazil to getting lost in the jungle, like insane stories to get to the border of the United States. And so I think that even when we are most well-intentioned, our blind spots of where we, the worlds that we're, we're functioning in, the structures that we're functioning in, we are guilty of that. And, and I, I, and this is a difficult thing to say because it doesn't always apply, but I want to be gentler with those that make mistakes. Um, because when we, because we will all make mistakes. And I'm not, and I'm not saying that like obviously white supremacist, racist, bullshit, like that's an extreme that is not part of the conversation. I think one of the most dangerous things that Donald Trump has done, and he has done so many dangerous things, is he has taken nuance out of our conversations. Everything is up, down, right, left, black, white. There's nothing nuanced. And we don't function like that as human beings. As artists, as storytellers, that is not how we tell stories. The beauty of life is in the nuance. And we have to get back to that place. Because I do think that when we get over this hump, that's how we heal. We heal in the nuance. And I really want to get to that place. I really want to be in a place where we can start talking about fucking healing. <laughs> Something. I had to write that down. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, and uh, so this question of how we, you know, you said something er earlier, Paula, that I, um, when we were talking about this as a race issue, and actually on the importance of nuances, how actually Europeans, when they were emigrating to the U.S. at the term, term of the century, were not white. Right. Uh, you know, our, our immigration policies are actually some of what shaped even our notion about who is white and who is not. And there's some, we don't have enough time tonight, but, you know, we could do, the, even the way immigration laws are written, not just in terms of who's a refugee and who's not a refugee, but who was entitled, historically, if it weren't for the civil rights movement, the literally literally discriminated based on race and immigration. The quota um, system. The yes. quota system. And, and before the quota system, the first, the first immigration law was in 1790. And it literally tried to define by race who could gain admission yes. through our immigration laws into the U.S. And the Supreme Court cases on how people tried to turn themselves, it, it, this whole argument about what, who was white and who was not. Um, it's an incredible, if any of you all go to law school, but you don't even have to, it's an incredible, incredibly disturbing history in and of itself that shows the relationship between immigration and defining whiteness yep. and defining people out of whiteness. Uh, and Asians were a big part of that in terms of Caucasian, yep. right? When South Asians were like, I'm Caucasian. Nope. Anthropologists call me Caucasian. So I can, and there's a Supreme Court says it says, oh, well, wait, that's not what we meant. To call Osawa versus the yes, United States exactly. in 1920. So I'm, I'm just saying that, so when we talk about the issue of race <laughs> and how we've racialized it as a, as a conversation and as an, it, but it's also the laws themselves have racialized it, but, and we but, should recognize that. Talking about the belonging part, like for me, talking about nuance, what Paolo was saying, we have been so dealing with the extremes of this that we're not even dealing with the fact that we belong. You know, there are 40, according to the Pew Research Center, there's 45 million immigrants in this country, the predominantly of whom are Latinx and Asian, right? And how our families, how we decide how to be American by, ex by embracing whiteness and then rejecting blackness, right? Like, I think that is a process that we're still trying to figure out. Mm. Something as simple as this. So I was home, I was home in the Bay Area where I'm from, I have 35 relatives, everybody's a US citizen or a naturalized citizen or born here, a green card holder except me, right? Out of 35, I'm the only one who's here, undocumented. I was home, I was watching my aunt put cream on my niece's neck. 
She has a really dark neck, I guess, and I guess the, well, she's, she's dark-skinned, um, and apparently the, the neck gets the darkest. My aunt was explaining this to me. And she bought this whitening cream from the Korean store, and she was applying it to my niece's neck, I mean to my cousin's neck, and I was like, what is she doing? Then I asked her where she got that from. So here's my aunt, right? And, you know, from the, as, as a Filipino, like, who was co colonized by the United States, we were, we were the first Iraq, we were the first Vietnam, right? Like, if you read the poem White Man's Burden, the subtitle, you know, it was interesting. The first time I read White Man's Burden was The Fire Next Time. James Baldwin quotes White Man's Burden. I didn't know that the subtitle of that poem was the United States and the Philippine Islands. Mm -hmm. The poem was written to justify America taking over the Philippines. So even that, and like the fact that my aunt feels the need to do that, because somehow my, my niece would be more accepted if her neck was lighter skinned. Like what does that mean? And mm -hmm. how does that, how does that, um, how does that kind of puncture our idea of who gets to belong? Um, and then after Trump was elected, I counted my family met relatives. 18 were eligible to vote, only five voted. And we're Facebook friends. And I was like, what? You know, I can't vote, I told you to vote. So I interviewed, you know, I'm a journalist. I interviewed my, my relatives and one, my aunt, my favorite aunt, Rosie, was like, Ton, that's my nickname in Tagalog, Ton. Um, I bought the Camry, I bought the house, I sent your cousins to school, I'm done. They don't really want us here, we're just here to work. America's consumerism, right? Like, we're not really here to, you know, participate. Right. So how have, how have we internalized that? And then she said, America is for black people and white people. It's not for us. I was like, what? That's my aunt, mm -hmm. you know? So I, this is where I think in many ways what Trump, what this era is doing, and when we talk about the festival of new, I think we need to figure out how do we get to this point of, talking about immigration and citizenship and this sense of belonging in a broader way, but also it, how to interrogate it even more. Mm. I think that hasn't happened enough. Powerful. Um, I wanna make sure we have a little bit of time for you to ask questions. Now, I'm gonna warn you, I am going to be Professor Wiley on this. <laughs> you wanna get, cause I promise everybody wants Everybody, everybody, for all the right reasons, really wants to be having a conversation. And uh, we need a public square for this conversation. But this ain't the public square. So when you come up to the mic, please have a question. <laughs> um, and as you come up to the mic, um, and while anyone comes up to the mic, if you have a question, I, I want you both to say what you think we can do to witness. What should we be doing to witness? So I think that's a long question with various uh, entry points to witnessing. I think the most important thing is to stay updated on what's happening, read those horrible stories. And trust me, I know they're horrible, but we have to read them, we have to know what's going on. Um, there are amazing activists and thinkers um, that you can follow on social media. I always say Jose is great to follow. Uh, Jess Morales Morquetto is great to follow from Families Belong Together. Uh, Erica Andiola from Raices and Alida Garcia from Forward. Those are like my people that I always put out. Um, if you speak Spanish, there are tons of organizations that need translators, whether it's here in New York uh, or whether it's down at the border. I like to work with small organizations. On the Tijuana side, the West Coast side, there's an organization called Al Otro Lado. Whether you're a lawyer or a Spanish speaker, that, they take volunteers. On the El Paso side, there's an amazing organization called Las Americas um, that lawyers, Spanish, just go volunteer, go help with whatever they need. Um, and then also, those are just off the top of my head, but um, if you go to my Instagram, which is my name, Paola Mendoza, on my like the website that you click on. I have an article that I wrote that has like 15 different things that's that really you can get involved in. Yep. And maybe we can, because one of them, I just want to lift this up because a friend of mine did this and I want to look into it, is you can, you can sponsor someone. Yep. Uh, and that is actually a really critical way many of us can witness uh, in a very activist way that 
also directly helps real Echoing people. everything that Paula said, but for me, the biggest thing about this as, as a gay man is just seeing like how a lot of what happened, we are in the middle of a culture war, <laughs> which means that so much of this relies on what you do where you are, right? Like the conversations that need to happen with your parents and your coworkers and your friends and literally not walking away, right? And risking your privilege to be uncomfortable, to be armed not only with information, but a way, to, but a way of engaging. So please go to our website. You can download all of our fact sheets. You can download the gift guide from Comfortable Conversations. Because I have to tell you, I was just in Baton Rouge in Louisiana, and I was amazed at like how all of these young white Southerners do not have the language to talk to their parents about this. And many of them just like, peace out. You know, I just can't handle my racist uncle. And I'm like, what can you do? I don't know if immigration reform is gonna come out of Louisiana, but you can deal with your racist uncle, go get him. You know, I'd rather you do that than like call people out on Twitter. <laughs> I'd rather you like deal with your family and deal with your friends than deal with strangers on social media. Go do that. That to me is really important. Can I just, I, yes, and I wanna give you the social science behind yes. that. There is Ooh. actual social science behind this point. If you have an experience, and this mm. is social psychology, if you have an experience with someone who is other mm -hmm. and has been othered, and it is positive encounter to stereotype, uh, and you share that, and I don't mean the literal story of the experience, but, it may, but, if, but if you're communicating that to those around you, it not only changes your own implicit and explicit bias by having that positive contact, the research actually shows that it goes beyond your, just your experience of it, that you can actually reduce the, it, the implicit and explicit bias of others. Mm. So it does yeah. matter. It totally and, matters. And, and, it, and, it, and it, I want to bring it back to something that Paula said earlier when you talked about, uh, I, this, I'm, I'm not going to say it as well as you did, Paula, um, but you talked about um, being more gentle with people who make mistakes. Because part of how we do that, and it can be difficult, it can be difficult, but it's easier with family sometimes because there's usually sometimes some love up in there, maybe. Yeah. We hope. We hope. Um, I can share some personal stories. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I did say my mother was from Texas, didn't I? Um, but, I but my point is when you, when you can do it with some compassion and, and without having and demanding perfection from the person you're talking to instantly, yep. you, you, you actually get farther down that road of getting them to what we call uh, frame breaking. You, you know, you're breaking those racist frameworks that society embeds. Um, and the media is one of the mechanisms, social, your community groups, your peer groups. Um, so, we, that I, I just, so I just want to say both of you made these points and I wanted you all to know there's actually some social science behind them. So as hard as it is, you could actually have a very, very big impact on a number of people just in your personal interactions. Questions? Some very brave person heading to the mic. We'll be gentle. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so it's... A tremendous honor to have you here tonight, to have you talking about these examples of risk taking. It's very moving. Um, I'm a member of the Sanctuary Working Group here, which is a collective which centers undocumented students, students of color, uh, staff and faculty to try to make the new school a sanctuary campus. Um, and I'm interested in hearing more about what kind of risks you see institutions like this university could be taking. Um, the New York State Dream Act was just passed, right? A lot more undocumented youth qualify for in-state aid. Um, universities need to have a plan in, in place to ensure there's access. Um, and it's really been a struggle here um, at this university. There's a kind of public image of this university, which is very social justice oriented, but the day-to-day -day experiences of students of color is a struggle. Um, well, faculty- I want to know more. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so faculty want to give a part of their salary uh, to create a scholarship for undocumented students, but um, our administration has not approved that. Um, 
we have asked the university to put its name on amicus briefs that are in federal court huh. um, supporting undocumented students and students affected by the Muslim ban, right? And, and like Manhattanville College, Rutgers Newark, Columbia, NYU, all these universities don't, the new school for some reason is not on there. Um, there are universities in the New York City area that have created centers for undocumented and immigrant students like Brooklyn College and St. Peter's University, but we can't even get the new school to hire an advisor for undocumented students. Um, and so students going into financial services, um, the staff are not trained, they're not specialized in what these students need, their hands are shaking yep. as they're processing their paperwork. And students from mixed status families are accused of lying when they say what their family's income is because they can't document it, their parents are undocumented. Um, so there are real concrete needs and, uh, and we're standing, we're here in Alvin Johnson Hall the legacy of Alvin Johnson in establishing this university um, at a time that anti-Semitism was so mainstream that, that the American Nazi party filled Madison Square Garden. He pulled it together and along with probably people whose names we don't know who were working with him, behind him, to sponsor 200 mostly Jewish uh, scholars and saving their lives, saving their knowledge from Europe. And so we think that this university needs to be bold and needs to, in its practices, have risk taking, um, not just as public image. Bali, you want to take that? One, one, one thing yes. I just want to say, I think it's extremely important and, and very, very grateful to the um, Sanctuary Group on campus for all its hard work. Uh, if we have to witness within our institutions as well as outside. I, I do want to just say, the university has been working on the um, paycheck contribution. Uh, specifically, uh, I just want to say this out loud, because it is important, not only for undocumented students, but for vulnerable, and some of that is also for the protection of undocumented students. So, so that is not, um, it is not because it is unimportant, it is more about anything that identifies in a database who is undocumented is actually also one of the things that the working group has raised the attention and it's an incredibly important one. Um, I can't speak to all of the things raised and, and I think they're important and I thank you for raising them. I haven't been here, I, I just I haven't been in the new school since I think I left New York. So I would love to, I'll get your info and then Great. so I'm happy to be here and um, I'm really happy to figure out how we can make some of those things possible. I have to tell you though that with, our, with, my, with what we're trying to do um, there are some universities that are okay about all of this if it's on the down low. They don't want to talk about it. I don't want to name the universities, not yet at least. But there are many universities who are like, we love undocumented students so long as we don't have to publicly talk about them because then we're going to risk our endowments. So I think again, in this time of risk taking, we have to figure out when does the silence really have to stop. So we're gonna deal with that this fall. And, so yeah. we do, and again, this is more just as a fact point for the community. Um, the board of trustees formally adopted a resolution that said ICE will not be allowed on campus uh, without a, a warrant uh, and has trained security staff. So they're, they're, So I just wanna say that it's, it's I, I think the issues are incredibly important because I think there are more things that the university can and should do. And I, and I think Sanctuary Working Group has really raised a number of tremendously important ones. I also just think it's important because one of the things we, I think, do need to do better in the university is be clearer with the university about what's in process <laughs> uh, and what's not. Um, and, you know, so that's, that's definitely a continuing growth opportunity for the university. So we'll talk say. after this. I'll give you my... And if I can say quickly, anyone who's interested, you can reach us at sanctuary at newschool.edu. Um, oh, cool. We have an event on November 16th about making the university a sanctuary campus. Great. Great. Thank you. And there is a mic on both sides. So. Oh, yeah. No, no, good, good. good. <laughs> um, I actually just wanted to say thank you, Paula and um, Professor Wiley and um, Jose for coming uh, here tonight. I traveled up from southeastern Pennsylvania to be here because oh, I just, you guys have, it's been an thank awakening. You. It's been an awakening follow, following you on social media. I mean, as Professor Wiley said, um, it's all out in the open now. 
and I've learned so much from you guys. So, um, yeah, thank you. Um, so my question, so uh, I'm a student in Pennsylvania and I am an intern at Church World Service, which is one of the nine refugee resettlement programs in the United States, um, really under attack right now. Um, when people find out that I'm interning there, um, and Pennsylvania is pretty conservative, at least the area I live in. So when people find out I'm interning there, they're like, How, why are you working with people who've come here illegally? And I'm like, oh, no, 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 these are the people that have come here illegally, they're legal. And I start to like notice that my own language is like validating that binary between legal and illegal. Um, and I'm just kind of like, but back up, actually like nobody's illegal, like I have to almost just get lost in my own explanation of things. So I kind of just wanted to bring up like that idea about the people who define, like the people who create the definitions, like you mentioned, really stuck with me because I find that in defending my clients or advocating for my clients, I'm so contributing. So I'm going to push you to question just so we can get to other. So yeah. sorry. Is that your yep. So my question, question is like, yeah. how, like, can you help me with the, like that kind of language, those definitions? How do I? avoid going into that binary. And let me just say this, by the way, we're saying this at a time in which the New York Times, our newspaper yeah. record, still uses the phrase illegal immigrant in its news pages and justify, justifiably so, right? And the Washington Post, actually NPR sometimes, so we're, we're working on that. But I have to tell you, this is why taking this out of the legality framework is so crucial because people are so stuck in it. Right? Like the question I get asked probably the most is, why don't you just get yourself legal? You know who asked me those questions? People who want me deported and people who want to help me out and then journalists ask me those questions. Meaning it even exposes the lack of awareness about process, about that there is no one size fits all process. So for me, when it comes to this, actually educating yourself about how to get away from the legality framework mm -hmm. and about the fact that in this country what's legal has always hasn't always been what's just mm -hmm. all you have to do is look at the past 50 years right from same-sex marriage was illegal but barring women from voting was illegal jim crow was the law of the land so taking it out of immigration and making it about actually well wait a second how are these laws constructed i think is really important and again go to our website we actually have language around this that can help you do that okay I would add, I think that's excellent. I would add one thing um, is part of what we learned from frame breaking is ask questions back. Yeah. Ask, in other words, you know, people aren't thinking. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and they're not even aware of what they're assuming, what their assumptions are and what their biases are. So sometimes you can ask them back, oh, um, how long do you think it should take yep. to go through a process mm -hmm. of getting documentation to come here? What do you think is reasonable? Yeah. And because they'll say something that is completely contrary to what's actually happening, yep. and it gives you a teaching opportunity. It's yep. like, oh, you know, that, that's interesting. You, you think it should take a year. Did you know it takes, a, a, on average, six years for a person in the country lawfully and with papers just to petition to get a minor child in the country? I, you know, you, those kinds of things which get them to, because then you're not lecturing them. Yep, yep. yep. You're having a conversation yep, with them. Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. So please go to our website so and check you. it out. Um, all right, we're going to go to the next person. Sorry, thank you. And thank you for traveling. Driving all the way up here. <laughs> Drive home safely. Hi, yeah. Pal. You, you mentioned that missing nuance in the conversation that blew my mind because it was so spot on and terrifying mm -hmm. at the same time. Um, given that this rigid political divide, do you believe that that nuance should now at least currently live in fictional storytelling in order to change the narrative in order to change hearts and minds? And if so, do you think it's, that's currently happening at scale to try to change culture? Do you even think that's possible? Um, that's so everyone. I think I'm gonna take this from the point of view of an artist. Um, I believe that the job of an artist, well, let me backtrack. I think what's happening in the United States and has been happening for a while, but has been expedited with Trump, is that we are suffering from a mass contraction of the heart. And literally that means that we are lacking in compassion for those that we don't know, those that are the other, even for those that are our neighbor. Um, and I think the job of the artist is to go into the heart and reopen the heart of America. So I, I believe that we do that by telling nuanced stories. I believe that that is a responsibility of the artist. The day after Trump was elected, 
literally on November 7th, was it the 6th or the 8th? The 8th, so November 9th, I was devastated as we all were, and all I could do was think to call my friends who were artists. And I went through my phone book, everyone in my phone book, and I didn't care if I knew you really well, if I barely, barely knew you, and I was like, what the fuck are you gonna do now as an artist? What are you gonna do? Does art even matter now that people are gonna be deported to their deaths, that the climate is gonna go haywire, that guns are gonna be everywhere? Like, what the fuck does art even matter at this moment? And I had really in-depth conversations with people, really beautiful conversations, really terrifying conversations. I had a conversation with Jose, and at the end of it, I talked on the phone for two days, just asking those questions to artists. At the end of it, I came away absolutely knowing that the power of art was going to be the thing that pulled us and pushed us through and through this moment. And it wasn't a miraculous revelation that I'm so brilliant. Like, that's what every artist has said in various times of tumultuous critical moments in the United States. So do I think it's happening? I think it's happening in various places. Do I think it's happening at scale? No. But I think that we have the, the, the tools to get those stories out to people um, in ways that we haven't been able to get them out before. You know, I, I think that um, uh, Ava's film, When They See Us, is an extraordinary example of what storytelling can do with regards to culture, specifically for the Exonerated Five, obviously. But also, when I saw that film, I saw that in a, the Apollo, the first two episodes, I would have walked out after the first one, not because it was not good, it was brilliant, because it was so infuriating and so painful, but I couldn't. But what I thought of that film, I was like, I hope Ava takes this film and uses it to inspire political action, because what she did with Trump in that film, or that series, I should say, was fucking brilliant, because it was placing him what he had done 25 years ago to where he is now and how horrible he is and what he has done to the black community and to get them out to vote, not that black women need to go out and vote because we know that they always do, but, but the point You're is, yes, thank you. But like, that is the power and the beauty of art and that is what we should strive to do. And, and did that film reach the masses? 100%. 100%. So scale-wise, so at Define American, I'm probably most proud of this. So we have consulted on 61 television shows. So whenever you see an undocumented character on Superstore or Roswell or Grey's Anatomy or the Party of Five series is about to happen, um, we are the, our organization actually reads the scripts, right? And say, wait a second, um, can you make her Caribbean? <laughs> can she be a doctor? Like, you know, the, the, day, um, the day Trump announced he was ending DACA, I got an email from Shonda Rhimes, because she's amazing, and Shonda Rhimes was like, how can we help? And I said, well, did you know that there's about 110 undocumented medical students in the country? So send them to us. So we sent five. We sent five undocumented medical students to the writer's rooms of, of Grey's Anatomy, so then they created a character based on those conversations. And the New York Times had a study after the election that said, the television show you watch is a greater indicator of who you voted for than the political party you belong to. Mm. And Grace Anatomy is one of the top five shows among Trump voters. Yeah. Did you know that? So we reached wow. more people by that character in Grace Anatomy than probably any CNN hit that we could have done. So being really intentional and scaling that work. So now at Define American, we're trying to figure out how do we scale that so that we can reach more writers' rooms that need to be doing this more. And, and I'll just give one fiction example. Since we've invoked James, James Baldwin, Giovanni's Room. Yeah. Giovanni's Room, I read that book when I was young, and it was mind-blowing, both because here was a writer writing a fictional love story of two white gay men. Mm. Um, and he was doing it as a black writer. So, so I just the but but that was a no one thought he could get it published. No, I'm, so yep. I actually think fiction and art and and the creative space is extremely important for challenging culture. Cool. Thank you. Very Thank you. Uh, we'll we'll ping pong. <laughs> so, yes, and I'm gonna because in the interest of time, just ask you try to be very brief and just get directly to a question so sure. we can get to it. I'll everything. do my best. Uh, my name is Marcus Longmuir. I'm part of the Jackson Heights Immigrant Solidarity Network. I just want to say thank you for having this conversation tonight. It's wonderful. Um, I want to touch on uh, the, the question or the part at the end about belonging. Uh, and you've drawn some parallels between reconstruction and what's happening today. Um, I'm part of the, the Census Counts group in Queens as well. 
and, and I'm seeing a lot of parallels between what are called hard to count populations where you've got the immigrant groups obviously who don't want to tell the government who they are, where they are, um, but also hard to count in the black neighborhoods in the city. So I was wondering if there was something that in, in the sense of belonging, because I, I think a large part of not wanting to be counted in the census is because you don't feel like you're part of that community. Yeah. Well, Have you any thoughts it, on that? It, so the Trump administration has done a great job of driving fear. Uh, and Republicans have underfunded the census. For, so even before Trump, intentionally underfunding the census, mm -hmm. uh, because as we know, a full count impacts the number of seats you get in the House, and it impacts state legislatures, and it impacts redistricting. So it goes straight to political power, and in changing demographics, it's easy to know who you can, whose count you can suppress, and it is based on race and class. And by the way, rural white populations don't do so well when they make it harder, as often is the case. Um, we actually, at, I helped found the Digital Equity Laboratory here, and we actually have a census project uh, working and training librarians because trusted people, in addition to community-based groups in vulnerable communities of color, in cl are often libraries. I mean, people are going there to uh, do all kinds of, and to get online. So we're actually trying to train librarians to better support people's ability to know how to navigate it safely. Um, and I will just say personally that I think, I mean, we, obviously the citizenship question is, isn't on, but there are a lot of reasons why people are afraid. Uh, but but I, I say this to say um, we will be sharing out, and there's a train the trainer tool, and as you know, the city has just announced a grant fund for community-based organizations to better support a fuller, fairer count. Um, but I think safety in that is an extremely important, uh, and that's a lot of what we're trying to support is the safety of it. So thank you for that point question. Yes. Okay, um, Professor Wally, Paola, Jose, I'm deeply honored to be here today. Um, Jose, something really hit me in where your aunt's words, like we are here to work. That's basically what I'm doing here. I'm here to study and go back to Colombia in a couple of years. Um, but at the same time, um, I feel this struggle all the time. Like, I cannot be here, extract knowledge, um, experience, and leave things that they, as they were. So um, I'm a tour guy here at the New School, and I always mention that the New School is one of the most international schools in the US, something that we are really proud of. It. Um, as, a good, as a positive thing, I really feel that it's a positive thing, but uh, we are here to do our thing, extract knowledge, and go back. But we also are here in privileged condition, good visas, we just need to play by the game, like take advantage of that OPT, work, play by the rules, and they come back. When you were in your times at media playing the game, do you feel, I guess, this struggle all the time? I want you to talk a little bit about that and I don't know how many people are here who are international students who are planning to go back to our countries after our OPTs end, but I think that we, do, we cannot leave things as they were as we arrived here. I've been thinking, because you know, I'm not, I can't, I have made the choice clearly to stay, mm -hmm. um, but as Paula knows, a couple of years ago after Trump got elected, I was actually, I'm gonna go. I'll see y'all later. I was going with you. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna write this book and I'm gonna be like, I, you know, I wanna go see the world, you know? Um, and so for me, clearly I've decided to stay, but part of the justification was so that my work has to be free. If I can't physically be free, then my, my work has to be really free. And part of that freedom has been really interrogating this issue as a global issue, mm -hmm. which I think we haven't done enough of. Mm -hmm. So this idea, you were talking about this, Paula, a little bit about part of, to me, the bastardization of what's happening in immigration is that we have made the courage of going here a bad thing. We make an assumption that you open the borders, everybody's gonna come. I would argue not. 
I would argue that people want to stay where they are, where they speak their language, where they have their dignity, where they can live their lives without trying to assimilate and integrate to something that they themselves don't even really freaking understand. Mm -hmm. So I finally came to this. I was in Louisiana when this happened to me in front of like 900 kids. And because somebody asked me, was my mom's sacrifice worth it of sending me here? And then I haven't seen her for 26 years. She's still in a waiting line to come here. Two more years left. She's been waiting for 16 years. And I actually said, for the first time, I said it out loud. I've never even said it to Paula, I don't think. I don't think it was worth it. I actually think I would have preferred to have a mom. Mm. I think, so giving people the dignity and giving people the resources to stay where they are has to be a part of this conversation. That's why, to me, the fact that Julian Castro has been talking about the Marshall Plan for Central America and Latin America, which has kind of been not a part of the... Con What's up with SNL? 56 million Latin people in this country, you can't find a single person to play them on Saturday Night Live? That was weird to me. So, so to me, what, what you're asking is, when I was in Indiana a few years ago, apparently some universities count foreign exchange students as their diversity. Yeah, here too. Oh, really? So, I didn't know this. So... The, you know, I would talk to mostly Chinese foreign exchange students who are, I mean, foreign students who pay out of, out of country tuition and then try to stay. So basically they become professional students because that's the only way to stay legally. And then some of them fall out of status. Somebody has to make a documentary just on that. Mm -hmm. So meaning the country is benefiting from the money that they're giving the institutions and yet there's no actual path for them to stay if they wanted to. So this idea of freedom of movement and what we owe each other is way bigger than nation states and governments. I think this is actually about humanity we're talking about. And we're looking at what, 272 million migrants in the world. And I would argue that we're only at the beginning stage of creating the language and, and the vocabulary about this. That is people led and not policy led. It has to be people led. That's why artists has to lead that conversation, not politicians and not diplomats. Sorry, that's my only answer to your question. And can I just say one thing? You, yeah, that was, you're not extracting knowledge, mm -hmm. you're bringing it. Yeah. Uh, first and, first and for, foremost, I want to say something to Professor Wiley. On my first day here on orientation, you spoke and you said something that I've carried with me till now, and that is that um, I deserve to be here. And that is something I've struggled with for a while. Um, I'm an immigrant, and I have a question about the re um, uh, legal uh, immigrants with documents. So there was a conversation. It left the media for a while and came back about Stephen Miller's proposition about if you're an immigrant who has uh, benefited from the welfare system in some form. The public charge. The public charge. Yeah. So what is the constitutional, constitutionality behind that and the legality of that actually becoming something that impacts my ability to become an engaged voter in this country? Well, Professor Wiley. <laughs> I'm sorry. So the short answer is um, you probably, because you're here academically, are not going to have a problem with public charge. The, 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 the folks, this is where... Uh, M many of us are vulnerable because of this administration, but we're not all equally vulnerable. Uh, because that really is something that's the, and by the way, they just, I don't know if you saw this news report, it was incredible today, it was just today, that they've done, pub public charge just means, um, they, 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 yeah, if, if you're gonna come here and we think you're gonna end up needing public benefits, like, you know, welfare assistance, then we can keep you out of the country. Um, even if you're going through, that we can use that as you try to get into the country through a lawful process to keep you out. Now, there's lots of reasons that that's obviously completely screwed up and problematic. Um, if, if you're here as a student getting a degree, you're not likely to be, even under this horrible <laughs> new, um, new rules, you're probably not going to be one of those folks. Um, there are lots of other people who are going to be much more... Um, likely to fall into that category. So I, I think you should just keep doing what you're doing. Yep. But I do think on the witnessing part, <laughs> right, which is, and a lot of us filed comments on public charge, uh, but also now thinking about what cities and states can do to backfill 
uh, particularly for folks who want to bring um, what they can do to kind of change and support the status of folks who are at least trying to bring other family members in, right? So I, I think there's a lot we have to think about and work on. There's, this is not about constitutionality in the sense that the Constitution is pretty much silence on all of this. It's all a political policy yep, construct. Yep, totally. Um, I also have a follow-up question, if that's okay. Um, it's about um, where do we begin on a national and local level to erase these like misconstrued borders and shed light on the nuances? Where does that conversation begin to make it digestible, to make the nuances something that people want to discuss and aren't afraid to discuss? Well, you know, I was sitting here listening to these questions and looking out to the audience and thinking that I got into immigration as an artist in 2008, let's say, so 11 years. And throughout those 11 years, I've spent every day of my life trying to get people to care about the issue of immigration. And really, it hasn't been until the last two years that I would say that people that are not directly affected or impacted by immigration have cared. And I think that, again, because we are surrounded by such negativity and such horror, it's important to, to highlight these moments of, of hope, and when I say hope, I mean hope with, with its strongest, more, most purest form, um, hope that generates change, and so to me that is hopeful. And so with regards to this idea of where do we begin with the conversation, you know, we're here, we're having it, and I truly think what we've talked about before is that you taking it back to your community, to your people, to those folks that you have to have those conversations with that make your palms sweat and make your heart race and make you stutter, like that's what you need to go and do. And that is that is how we move forward um, because you care, uh, because that is the way in which we get to healing eventually. Um, and because that is, I believe, the only way forward. Thank you. Thank we're, you. We're, we're, we're over time, but we have one last one, so we'll just make it real quick and we'll, we'll get answers and then I'll thank our guests. Thank you so much for filling, uh, the, I mean, for everything, but also for allowing me to ask the question. Um, I was actually going to move to Greece in August to work with refugees under a grant that I got, um, but the Greek government blocked me because I was going to be there for working with refugees. Um, and um, again, I really liked how you all said that it's really a complex um, global issue. Um, and I guess uh, as a third generation Greek American whose family members largely are supporting Trump and supporting his um, um, anti-immigrant um, rhetoric, um, a big question that I have sort of confronted while talking with them is the sense of belonging that they feel is in threat. Um, that if uh, there are a lot of Mexican immigrants coming in their small uh, town, then they won't know their language. So they'll feel sort of unknown, right? They'll be in this unknown situation, um, especially uh, Muslim immigrants or ref and refugees coming. They don't know the religion, the culture. So, so it's it's this 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 idea of people here, um, they feel a threat, um, a lot of who I've spoken to feel a threat of their own belonging if immigrants and refugees are coming. So how do you, how do you sort of approach that? I just have to say like that has been so consistent in the history of this country in terms of what we felt when the Irish came, when the Italians came, when the Polish came. Um, the difference though, and you know, Professor Wiley spoke to this, is that all those European immigrants got to be white. And now, most of the immigrants coming in, that's not gonna be so physically easy to do, no matter how many whitening creams my aunt puts on my cousin's neck, right? So this gets us then to frame breaking, I love that phrase, to some of the myths. This country does not have an official language <laughs> by design. And we are stronger in a globalized economy to speak different languages, right? I, what I found, I spent a month in Alabama <laughs> right after I came out as undocumented because I'm crazy. Um, and I'll never forget being on a walk, because whenever I go to like a town, my, my, my friend Costello Alonso and I do this together actually. Whenever I go to a town that's like I don't know, I go to the Walmart and look at the ethnic aisle. Because <laughs> for me, it's like a good parameter of do they have like Asian aisle? You know, so I went to the Walmart right outside of Birmingham and I'll never forget this elderly white woman in this aisle and the other aisle were two Latin women speaking Spanish and this white woman just out of nowhere goes, I don't understand why they just can't speak English. 
The journalist in me approaches her. Her name was Connie, i.e. at the end. Um, you know, and usually when we talk about this, we get to the five-minute conversation, which is that she just doesn't understand why these people can't speak. But I stayed with her for about 20 minutes and then found out that her kids just put her in a home. And about 20 minutes into this conversation about why she felt so uneasy, she goes, what if I can't learn Spanish? And I said to her, Connie, like, I don't think you need to learn Spanish. Like, I don't think that's going to be mandatory. <laughs> so it was coming from this place of just fear, right? And I, again, this gets us to how does that happen? And I think this is where the role of stories in our communities matter the most, right? Like, even talking to your parents about, wait, I remember I made a film for MTV called White People a few years ago, and I went to this place in Bensonhurst where the Italians were complaining that there were so many Chinese people, and now that the town that used to be Italian is now Chinese. And then I talked to the dad who got here when he was five from Italy, the dad who says, these Chinese people, why can't they just learn English? So I said to him, well, Angelo, how long did it take you to learn English? Oh, it took me 15 years. <laughs> so wait, it took you 15 years, but now you're hating on the Chinese who got here five years ago? Can you give them a little bit more time? <laughs> oh, yeah, huh? <laughs> so I'm looking for these conversations that are like, oh, huh, oh, yeah, huh? Again, but stories do that, right? And I would love for you to hopefully, and you're probably already doing this, engaging your relatives about this. I saw my big, my big fat Greek wedding. That could have been called my big fat Filipino wedding. It could have been anything, right? I mean, we have more in common than we do different. You know, I wish everybody would really sit with that. Maya Angelou said that, right? We, are, we have much more in common than we do different. And I think that is part of the key to what the healing needs to be. We have to end. Thank you for that question. Thank you for all the questions. Um, I, I, I was going to end with a different James Baldwin quote, but that made me want to end with this, uh, 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 this James Baldwin quote. I imagine one of the reasons people cling to their fears so stubbornly is because they sense once hate is gone, they will be forced to deal with their pain. So our job is to help support people yeah. get past their hate so, they can, so we can actually help them heal. Yep. And that we will heal in the nuance, yeah. as Paula said. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Paula. Thank you, Jose. Go be witnesses. <laughs>